Okay, so we might not get through this whole topic today. If we have a bit left over, we'll probably have quantum numbers left over to do on the first hour of the Thursday group learning session. Um, and then we'll do um, some group work on Thursday. Um, so before we get into what is the atom and all that, we'll talk about how the view of the atom has changed over time. So it was originally in 1808 where Dalton just developed the first atomic theory. And that's where he said that there were these spherical solids and he called them atoms. And he said that they had measurable properties. About 90 odd years later, J.J. Thompson came along and he did a little bit more work in the field and he came up with the electron and the fact that there was negative and positive particles within these atoms and he proposed the plum pudding model. So how did he work out that there was these negative particles and therefore positive particles. He had a magnet and he put it against the cathode ray tube and the ray was either attracted or deflected from that magnet, whether he put positive or negative. So if he had the positive side, it was attracted. If he had the negative side, it was deflected. And from that interaction, he deduced that there was these negative particles uh, that were produced and he called them electrons. And he said if there's these negative ones, there will be these positive ones. And the way that they would be arranged would be in this model here. So it's a positive sphere. And within that positive sphere, there were these, uh, these regions of these negative um, species within there. So the electrons existed in it. So they called it the plum pudding. So it's like a cake with sultanas, I guess, stuck all through it. The sultanas are the electrons. The cake or plum pudding is the positive area. So they're scattered around, essentially. So that was all well and good, but pretty soon after, uh, Rutherford, so only a couple of years later, Rutherford came and he disproved this plum pudding model. So the way that he disproved it is he put some alpha particles through a thin sheet of gold metal and what he saw was there was this deflection occurring. So if we had this sphere of positive and these electron around just randomly within that positive sphere, we would expect that alpha particle to just pass straight through, but he didn't see that. He saw the deflection. So. So he saw the alpha particles coming in, hitting something and then bouncing off on a different angle. So when he was picking up that data, he then said, well, there must be something solid in the middle of that atom that's deflecting these particles. And he proposed the first nuclear model. So he proposed that there was a nucleus in the middle and it was deflected, uh, the alpha particles deflected off this harder central part of the atom. Uh, he didn't fully, fully spell it out, but a couple of, or pretty much at the same sort of time, Bohr was working on it as well. So he proposed the Bohr model of the atom, which is the very fundamental uh, imagery that you'd have of an atom. And it's pretty much, you've got the protons and neutrons in the middle, and you have these electrons on fixed orbitals that are going around that central uh, nucleus. Uh, this was disproven because it only worked for the hydrogen atom. And then we got our physicists involved, not, not too far after that, and they came up with the wave mechanical model, which uh, goes into the actual three-dimensional shape of the probability of electrons existing in a particular place at a particular time. So we'll go a little bit more into the wave mechanic and the quantum mechanic models um, in a few slides. But the key terminology, they shift from orbits to orbitals and it's all prob probability based rather than um, a fixed path that they're existing on. Okay, so, so we then had the planetary model of the atom that came in. Okay, so when we're talking about orbitals, we're talking now about regions of space. 
and they're three-dimensional regions of space and it's probability based now. So before we go further into those, we'll talk a little bit about electromagnetic radiation. So when energy travels through space, it travels as a photon or a quantum of energy and it can be characterised as very broadly ionising energy or non-ionising energy. So ionising energy is energy that's got enough, um, it's got the ability to knock an electron off the actual atom and produce an ion, so it becomes a charged species. And this includes things like gamma rays and x-rays. So we've got, sorry, I think I've got a little. So gamma rays and x-rays and just the top end of the ultraviolet uh, wavelengths come in under that ionising energy. Uh, the next one down is the visible region and we've got the infrared. So the ones that we particularly use in chemistry are the UV light and the infrared. So the UV is the, uh, the energy corresponding to when the molecule might have a promotion of an electron up and then it will release back down again. So we'll have a, a transition occurring in the, in the orbitals. So the types of compounds that undergo this are conjugated compounds. So a conjugated system we'll go into when we get into organic, but it's when you have a double, single, double, single, double, single bond system within the molecule. So it's called a conjugated system, which we'll talk more about a bit later on. And also transition metal compounds can do this. So in bio and phys chem, we have a whole topic on transition metals. And that's in September for those of you that are in the biomedical program. Uh, the visible is the region in which we can see and you've got the infrared. So this is where you have the vibrational and rotational energies. So not enough energy to promote electrons, but it's enough energy to excite the atoms within the molecules and make them vibrate and rotate. So they're kind of like, if you think of the atoms as being on a, a slinky, so like a little coil and they're vibrating and rotating and that sort of energy can be picked up and we can use that to determine the functional groups within a particular molecule. Um, after infrared we're getting into uh, microwaves, radio and low frequency uh, wavelengths. So very basically when we're looking at energy transfer so this little image up here, we're looking at a hydrogen atom. Okay, that's it here. The little squiggly red line is some, a wavelength of energy. It enters the atom, it excites the atom, it gets all these little red squiggly lines coming off it and it's in an excited state. So when the energy comes in, it promotes the electrons up. It becomes excited, so excited is when the electrons are not in the ground state, so the lowest possible energy, and then they release again and they go back to that ground state and then that energy is released from the atom. When that energy is released, oh, wrong computer I'm drawing on now. When that energy is released, that wavelength will correspond maybe to a region in the visible spectrum, and if so, we would see a colour for that particular compound. So there's some um, salts there in that image there. These, they're just lithium, copper and sodium that are dissolved in methanol and they've just been lit. And when they've lit in a dark room, they will show uh, colours depending on the wavelength that's emitted. So the energy coming from the flames. Yeah doesn't work, no, not in our labs, just sets the alarms off. Fireworks, I'm always interested in fireworks. From our house, sorry, we live up on a hill, we can always see fireworks, they're like every other night. And so I always like to look at the, refresh my memory on what the fireworks, so when we have the fireworks, we've got all that energy, and that energy is the wavelength being emitted 
when they're going from the excited down to the lower state and that colour that we're seeing from the fireworks um, corresponds to the wavelength uh, of those particular compounds. So red we have uh, usually strontium or lithium salts that are in the fireworks and we get 600 to 646 nanometers, that's the wavelength for that one. And the yellow, for example, is 580 to 560. What have we got there? We've got sodium, sodium salts for those ones. But anyway, we can't play with that. Okay, so the Bohr model. So this is the Bohr model. So we've got the, the top one here. We've got the center, the nucleus. It's got these positive particles in there. It's in the nucleus in the center. And we have this negative electron fixed orbit going around that positive center. Okay, so we've got the terminology. Oh, I'm just going to come out. Wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. Okay, so we've got the terminology fixed orbits. So fixed paths around that central nucleus. It's considered a particle. So that electron is a negatively charged particle that's on that fixed path going around. When we have the excited state and then we have the release of that energy back down to the ground state, we're moving up from one orbit or one orbit, so a lower energy orbit up to a higher energy orbit if energy is accepted into that atom and then when it's released it's going from the higher back down and it's only going to go on those orbits so on those specific energy levels um, what else have we got here okay so limitations it only works for hydrogen atoms. As soon as you put in more than one electron in there, it doesn't match up. And the electron is considered only as a particle and they are the two major limitations. We know uh, from the quantum model that you should be considering the electron uh, not as a particle, but as a wave. And then we go into all the probability. So how do they produce the line spectrum of the hydrogen? So with the Bohr model, I said that there's, there's these circular orbits that exist around the centre and they've got specific energies. So the energy between them correspond to particular wavelengths. So if it gets excited, it accepts that wavelength. Uh, the electron moves up and then when it gets uh, releases that energy, it goes back down to that lower energy. And it can only happen if the wavelength corresponds to that particular energy gap. So the way they worked out what these energy gaps are is they had hydrogen gas in a sealed tube. When they put energy into it and passed the light that was produced through a prism, they got different colours that were picked up. And these different colours represent the wavelength of those particular energy gaps. So when they say, when you think about the Bohr model, you need to think of a flight of stairs. And when you're thinking of the quantum models, you need to think more of a ramp. So there's, and that's supposed to refer to the fact that there are discrete steps, discrete energies that exist within this model. Okay, I think that's, that's most of that. Um, so when we go on to the wave or the quantum mechanical model of the atom, it's a mathematical uh, theory and it's got to do with physics and maths and very, very smart people. And I won't pretend to understand all the ins and outs of this model. It's not an area of interest to me, but just understanding that very, very fundamental level is all we need to know. So. It's based on Schrodinger's, Schrodinger's wave equation and the solutions to, these, to this equation represents the probability mapping of the orbitals, so the different shapes which we'll go into. So the psi, so this, this symbol here, represents the wave function. So that's the specific orbitals. 
which we'll go into in a bit. And when this is squared, it represents the probability of finding an electron in a particular point of space. And this probability is based on 90%. So 90% of the time you'll see an electron in that region of space. So these are the orbitals we're talking about. So the lowest energy is our s orbitals, which are our spheres. And we get into our p's, which are our bow ties. Oh, little bow ties. There's two little novel things joined together, like a bow tie. Um, so we've got our s, we've got our p's, we've got our d's. They go crazy. Don't worry about learning your d's. Just know there's five of them. And then we've got our Fs at the bottom, and there are seven of those ones. So these pictures, these orbitals, these three-dimensional shapes, are the solutions to the Schrodinger's equation, and they're based on the 90% probability. So it's what they call a beehive model. So they've just kind of looked at where the electrons most likely exist, and they've just drawn a a shape around where 90% of the time it exists. So it's not 100%, we're just at that 90%. So in this subject, we focus mainly on the S and P and knowing the shapes, knowing the axes. Uh, with the Ds, knowing how many there are, and with the Fs, knowing how many there are, there are and how to use them. You don't need to remember the shapes and the designations of those ones. We'll do that. We'll do the Ds in Byron Fizz Camp and we will never go into the Fs. So like I said, this is based on a wave. It's based on the standing wave. So it's, it's like a guitar string. You have your nodes, so your fixed points of the guitar string. And when you pluck the string, you'll get a particular vibration and harmonics associated with that. So the orbitals are the same. So we've got these fixed points. We need to have harmonics occurring. The fixed points are the regions between the different orbitals where no electrons exist. And they need to work together to be able to exist. We can't have constructive interference where we have, um, for example, an orbital that's not quite uh, fitting in right and we haven't got that nodal space between them because then the whole theory doesn't work. So we've got these nodal, nodal positions. Um, and a nice little picture here shows you that. So if you have an n equals 4, for example, you'll have these four points, 2, 3, 4, 5. You'd have, you could have five points to the, to, the, um, to the image. And then if you have a mismatch and they're not quite matching up, then you can't continue on with that pattern. So that's a nice little visual one to kind of hopefully kind of see what we're going on about. So what you can see here, we've got n equals 4, n equals 5, n equals 4 and a third doesn't work. So they're whole numbers that we're going to be looking at. And we'll get into the quantum numbers and representing these mathematically at the end of this topic. So for now, we'll just accept that there's nodes, fixed points, nothing exists on the nodes and they have to be in harmonics with each other. They need to be able to work together and they're standing waves. Oof, not used to talking so much. All right. Okay, so before we get into quantum numbers, we will go back to the structure of an atom. So this is where we're at today with the structure of the atom. So inside the nucleus, we have our protons, which are our positively charged species. We have our neutrons, which have no charge, so they're neutral. And then outside of the nucleus, we have our electrons in their orbitals. The corresponding mass, so the electrons are a lot lower in mass than the protons and the neutrons. And like I said, the electrons are negatively charged and the protons are positively charged. 
So this image here is quite interesting. So the protons and the neutrons are in the centre of the atom and there's actually quite a lot of empty space before you start getting to where the electrons are. So to put it in relative, something that we can think of uh, that would make sense to us, that how big that gap is, it's like if the protons and neutrons are on one side of the football field and then the first electron was on the other side. So all that gap between the protons and neutrons and electrons is just empty space. So atoms are mostly empty space and the species within them are so far apart. Um, yeah, it's quite a, quite a big distance between them. So this is how we look at our elements usually. So X would be your elemental symbol. So from your periodic table, A is your mass number. So that's the number of protons plus neutrons. So our positive and our neutral charge species. And the atomic number is the Z and that's the number of just the protons. So when you're looking at an element, there'll be two numbers. There'll be a large one and there'll be a smaller one. The smaller one is the protons and the larger one is the protons and the neutrons. So if the element has no overall charge on it, the electrons and the protons will be the same. So the positive and the minor negative will cancel out and you'll have no charge on it. So let's have a go at some examples. So here's our periodic table. This is the one that I'll feed in as an attachment on your exam. So this is the one we usually work with. We don't do printouts and hard copies anymore of anything. We're all online and digital. But this is the one that I would normally hand out and say, oh, okay, colour it in with some pencils and highlighters and make it look pretty. So so, so this is this is it. So the thing I like about this one is we have this kind of key that sits in the middle of it. So your element is the, the big B. So for this one here, it's boron. And then your atomic number, which is five, is the number of protons. So that tells you what the element is. That never changes. And the mass or the relative atomic mass is the protons plus your neutrons. And this number isn't a whole number because it's, we'll find out in a few slides actually. Let me get that away. But that, that's how we get it from our periodic table. So in a lot of your questions, you might be given them and then it's just a matter of working from the data you're given. You might be given the number of protons and you might be asked to find what element it is. So there's only a certain amount of ways we can ask these questions. So let's have a go at C which is carbon. So we want to know how many protons and neutrons are there in the nucleus of the following uncharged atoms. So uncharged being the key information that we need, saying that the protons and electrons will be the same. So there's no overall charge on that one. So for carbon, what would be the number of protons firstly? number of protons? Six. Six, yeah, cool. So always looking at the numbers, the smaller number tells you what the element is and the number of protons. So protons equals six. I'll just write P. And then what would be the neutrons? Put an N for that. What's neutrons? Six, yep. So how do we work out the number of neutrons? Yep, general mumbling sounds good. So it's the bigger number minus the smaller number. So 12 minus 6. Yep. So we get 6 for that one. So we're not asked about electrons, so we won't, we won't bring that in at this point. So next we have calcium. So we've got 40 and 20. So what would be the number of protons? Who wants to have a go at that one? 20? Yep. Protons is 20. And the neutrons? 20. 20. They're a bit round, aren't they? They're not very creative. So how do we work that out? We chose the bigger of the two numbers, so the 40, 
and we subtracted the smaller number. So we got 20. So I think most people have some sort of computer with them today, but if you don't bring a computer, make sure you bring some pen and paper to the lectures. So we're going to be working through problems as we go along. Um, yeah, cool. So what about the element in question two? We've got X for the symbol, we've got 55 for the protons and neutrons, and we've got 25 for the protons. What element would that be? Yep, very good. So how did we work that out? So we looked at the smaller number and we saw, which was 25, and we remembered that the smaller number tells you what element it is. So it's a number of protons which never changes on an element. Then it's a matter of finding a periodic table, which hopefully you'll all have within one click away from you or one slide of the paper away from you when you're doing chemistry because you need it. It's, you'll need it all the time. And then we look at our elements. We know the smaller ones in the top left. So we've got one, two. I'm not going to go and highlight each of them. Ooh. But you can see we go do, 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 scanning through. We're at 19 here and then we've got 20. 25 and that MN, which is manganese. Okay, so find the smaller number, scan through your periodic table, find the element. Okay. Okay, so what, do, what happens when an atom is charged? So when they're neutral, it's, it's just you see what we do. We just look it up on the periodic table or the data that's given and we know the electrons and protons are equal. Now, if we have a charged atom or an ion and maybe a positively charged atom, so a cation, or it might be a negatively charged ion, which is an anion, and we need to then change the way we work things out. It's only going to affect the number of electrons. So if you've got a positive charged ion, then you'll have less electrons than the number of protons. So when they're neutral, our protons, our electrons, when we become positive, we've got more protons, less electrons. When it becomes negative, we've got more electrons and less protons. The number of protons can't change, so you'll have to do it relative to the protons. So if it's a cation, so it's a positively charged species, and let's say you've got, I think I've got an example actually, rather than just making things up. So I've got calcium two plus. So the number of protons, what would that be? 20? Yeah, we just did it on the other slide. The number of neutrons would be we've got 40 minus 20 gives us 20. So protons, neutrons, and then the number of electrons. So if the number of protons is 20 and we've got a 2 plus, that means we've got two more protons than we do electrons. So our number of electrons would be 20 minus 2, which would give us what? 18, yeah. Okay, so we can't change the number of protons, we just adjust the electrons. So if we have something that's negatively charged, we're going to have extra electrons. So for example, fluorine, what's the number of protons? Nine, yep, so we're looking at the smaller of the two numbers. So it's nine, and we've got a negative, so what would be the number of electrons? 10. Yep. So we've got nine protons. We're going to have one more electron because we've got an overall negative. So we're going to have 10 electrons. Okay, and that is it. So I'll give you a little bit of time to think about these ones and then we'll go through them. 
So we want to look at them and assign the protons, the neutrons, and the electrons onto these three here. So if you've got your laptop there, you might want to pull up a periodic table. Not that you really need one, but it's good to have one there, one button away. How'd we go? Did we all have a bit of a go at those? Who needs longer? No one from the middle? Yeah, cool. If you think you've got it, just check with the person next to you that they've got it. So if you've done chemistry before, and if you haven't done chemistry before, you might want to make friends. <laughs> that could be your pickup line. You want to be friends? Uh, have you done chemistry before? I don't know. <laughs> the, best, the best way to learn something is to try and teach it to someone else. Yeah. So it should be mutually beneficial. Alrighty, so we'll go through these ones and then I've got one more slide and then we'll take a break for a little bit. I know it's a lot of information. So we can just get you to refocus for just a, another minute or two. So oxygen 2 minus, what's the number of protons? Eight, yep. The number of neutrons? Eight and eight is 16, yep. So 16 minus eight would give us eight. And then the number of electrons? Eight plus two because we've got that negative two, which will give us 10. Is there any questions with that one? No? Okay, so calcium, we've done this one before. So what's the number of protons? Number of neutrons? Yep, so 20 and 20, and the number of electrons? 20, yep. And calcium plus the number of protons? 19, yep. The number of, what's next, neutrons? 39 minus 19 gives us 20. Yep, and then the number of electrons. Yep, so 19 minus 1 because we've got a positive charge, so we want more protons. So take away and we get 18. Okay, so that's, that's it for that one.
Uh, so the last thing before we have a break, I just wanted to mention isotopes. So when we looked at the periodic table, we noticed that the, the larger of the two numbers was never a whole number. It was like, depending on what version of the periodic table, you might have up to four decimals afterwards. That's based on the relative abundance of the different isotopes of that particular compound. So an isotope is an atom of the same element, so it's got the same number of protons, because that tells you what element it is, so the smaller number, but it has a different mass number. So when you add them together, the protons and neutrons, it's a different number. So basically that's meaning it's got a different number of neutrons. It's not affecting what the element is, but it's affecting that overall mass number. So different number of neutrons and the value we get on the periodic table is determined from the natural abundance of the isotopes of that particular element that's on the periodic table. So for example, hydrogen, if we skip right down to the bottom of the slide, hydrogen has 1% when it's got a mass of 2 and 99% of the time it has a mass of 1, so we end up with like 1.01, depending how accurate you want that, depends how many decimals you go to. Okay, so they just work it out based on that relative abundance of it. So there's lots of different isotopes. So there's helium, carbon, nitrogen. Carbon and hydrogens are the ones that we use for nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, uh, which we'll talk about at a later date. Um, but that's how we work out what compounds are what, basically. In a big machine, you get to walk up and drop it in the top very carefully. But anyway, isotopes, different number of neutrons. Now, when we're looking at that mass number, when we get into our chemical calculations, um, we'll talk about how many decimals to do everything to. But for, for now, we don't really need to worry too much. Okay, so let's get into these orbital. So this is our probability mapping. 90% of the time they exist within these regions of space. Um, you can see with our S, so our S orbitals are our lowest energy orbitals. They're spheres around the nucleus. In between the different S orbitals, so depending on the energy level, you'll have a, a small S and you'll have a larger one and a larger one. They'll just go around each other. In between them, there are these nodal regions. So these regions of space where no electrons, in theory, exist. So that's our standing wave. That's the nodal point. So we don't have them between the orbitals. Um, but this is what I was talking about with that beehive model. So they've done the probability of the electrons and they're just 90%. Let's just go with that. So that's how the shapes have come out. So we've got our S. So our 1S is our smallest, lowest energy. Our 2S is our slightly bigger, um, higher energy, 3S. And we go all the way up to uh, 7 on our periodic table. And if we were to plot the radial distribution versus the distance from the nucleus, you'll see that the peak is very, very close to that nucleus for the 1s. That's the 1s, isn't it? Yes, 1s. So it's in nice and close to the nucleus. The 2s will be further away and the 3s further again. So our next one is our p. So this is what I said, those little bow ties that we've got. They exist on the X, Y, and Z axes. So we have three different P orbitals for each energy level. So we'll have a energy level 2, we'll have a 2X, a 2PX, 2PY, 2PZ. And then for the third energy level, we'll have a, a PX, PY, PZ for that energy level. So with the S's, we only have one for each of those orbitals, uh, each of those energy levels. With the D's, we've got five. Okay, we don't need to know what they are, but the DZ squared, DX minus Y squareds and, and stuff like that. So don't worry about those designations. 
And then for the Fs, they even get even more fancy, and we've got seven of them. So I'll show you a little trick on the periodic table when we come up to a periodic table next. Maybe the next slide, I'm not sure. Um, and I'll show you how to remember those values. So before we get into that, we'll talk about the penetration effect. So the penetration effect is how far can an electron in one of the orbitals penetrate in towards the nucleus, so where the protons and neutrons are. So how far in that shape of that orbital can it get into the nucleus? So when you have the S orbitals, this one here is a nice one to look at, you've got your 1S here. It comes, this is where the nucleus is, so it comes in nice and close. Um, I don't like that, let's take that out. We've got the, the 2S next, and then we've got the 3S. So you can see the 1S is closer, the 2S is further away, and the 3S is the furthest away out of those three. So you would say that the 1S, the electrons can penetrate into the nucleus better or it will be closer than something that's in that 3S because it's further away. Does that make sense? Yep, so the 1S is more penetrating than the 3S. So those electrons have more chance of getting closer to the nucleus. That makes sense for the S's, okay? So 1S is going to be the closest, 2S, and then the 3S. When you start overlaying everything, then it gets a little bit difficult because thinking about the... The P's, the little bow ties, they actually come quite close to the centre. So if we look at this, this picture here, we've overlaid the third energy level, so the 3S, the 3P and the 3D. So you'll see that the peak of the 3S is now actually the furthest away out of that third energy level. The 3P, we have one, two peaks. And then the 3D, uh, we have the, the main peak in there. So looking, did I get that all right? Yeah, no, yeah. Oh, okay, and then we've got the, okay, so this is the 2P, the 2S, and we've got the 1S. So I know you can totally see that all scribbled up there. But you can see the 1S is the most penetrating. And then the next most penetrating isn't the 2S, it's actually the 2P that gets in closer than the 2S. That, that yellow one's slightly further in than that second pink one. And then out of the third energy level, the 3D is closer in than the 3P and the 3S. And that's got to do with those weird and wonderful shapes that they make. So they actually go quite close to the nucleus compared to the S's. Yeah, we love that as an MCQ question. Um, what else do I need to say? Oh, that's a clearer picture, but anyway. Um, uh, so, and the other thing on that slide there is that if there is electrons closer in, they're going to shield the outer electrons from penetrating in the center there. So we've got the shielding effect as well. Okay, so this is our periodic table here. So this one here is different to the one I've been showing you because it is colour-coded according to the orbitals that the outer electrons for that particular element will exist in. So um, we will use this one here to do electronic configuration in a few slides. Maybe the next slide, not sure. But the way we look at this one, it's colour-coded here for you uh, to refer back onto. But your first two columns, so that block there, are your S orbitals. The value next to each of the, the rows, the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, that's referring to the energy level of that S orbital. So hydrogen and helium, the outer electrons, will exist both in that 1s orbital. So both in that s block and it's on level 1. So if we look at rubidium, 
here. That one's a 5S. So it's on number 5, energy level 5, and we're still in that S block for the last electron that we're counting. So the elements that exist over here, oh, that's not very straight, are our P. And you follow along that energy level the same way. So if I was to look at that first energy level, if I go across onto the P, there's actually nothing there. Okay, that's good. That's what we want. There isn't any that exists there. Then if I look on my second energy level, I've got two S's that exist, and then I've got P's, a block of P's. If I count across that block of P's, I've got one, two, three, four, five, six elements. And if I divide that by two, it will tell me how many different orbitals I have there. And the reason for that is because each orbital can hold two electrons. So if you can't remember how many p electrons, uh, p orbitals, blah blah blah, if I can talk properly, if you can't remember how many p orbitals there are, count across the p block. You see there's six divided by two. And that will remind you there's those three P orbitals. So your X, your Y, and your Z axes. So if we do the same for the next one, so our Ds are in the middle here. If we count across there, you'll count 10, which represents our five Z orbitals, which we don't need to remember the exact designations for. In our Fs are all the way down here. If we count across, there should be 14. So that corresponds to, by that one by two, gives us our seven F orbitals that we have. So that's kind of where the orbitals are shown on this periodic table. Now helium, depending on how the periodic table is drawn, it might be up next to hydrogen when it's showing you the way the orbitals are arranged, or it might sit over on the noble gas side um, above neon if it's showing you the chemical, um, more of a chemical sort of distribution and showing you that helium is a noble gas. So that one tends to float depending on the periodic table that you're looking at. Okay. So electronic configuration is a standard notation for assigning where the electrons are in a particular atom. And this is the first step that we're going to do, and then we're going to go into quantum numbers from this. So what we want to do is we want to look at an element on the periodic table. We want to see how many protons there are in it. And then assuming that it's neutral, the question will tell you whether it's got a charge or something, but first of all, we'll start with neutral examples. The number of electrons will be the same as the number of protons if it's neutral. And therefore, you can assign that amount of electrons based on the rules that we'll go through um, in a little bit. So there's a few different ways you can do it. I tend to do it off the periodic table because purely it's very easy to get a periodic table if you're ever out in the workplace and you need to randomly assign an electronic configuration. You can do it because the periodic table is easily available. If you use the fill diagrams, I think it just is confusing and it'll probably be hard to find one if you needed one. Um, so the reason that we want to look at electronic configuration is because it helps us understand the chemistry behind different atoms and different elements, uh, which we'll see uh, later on through your chemistry subjects. So things like magnetic properties and their ability to form chemical bonds. We've got a few principles that we follow or rules that we follow. So we've got the alpha bar principle. So that's the principle of how you build up those electrons and how you assign them to their different um, orbitals. We've got Hans rule and we've got the Pauli exclusion principle, um, which we'll describe when we do examples. Um, so, oh no, we've got that in the next slide. So the order of filling, so the alpha bar principle we fill the lower energy orbitals before we fill the higher energy orbitals. And we do this so that we can have the overall lowest possible energy confirmation of the atom. We have no more than two electrons in any orbital. So 
So remember, each orbital can hold up, up to two electrons. And those electrons will have opposite spins on them so that they don't repel each other. So Hahn's rule is that you, when you're filling a set of orbitals that have the same energy, so for example, the 3p, remember if you count the p block, you get six. So it means that there's three orbitals that are in those. I said, hopefully you remember, I said it a few times. We've got the 3px, you've got the y and you've got the z. So if you're looking at that third energy level, there'll be three p orbitals, the x, the y, the z, and they've all got exactly the same energy. We call them degenerate. So they've got the same energy as each other. So when you're filling it, it doesn't matter which one you fill, there's no um, overall advantage for that atom if you fill one over the other. They're all exactly equivalent. So when we fill them, we want to put an electron in each one and then we want to go back and double it up. So they so put one in each and then go back and double them up. And we'll show you when we do some examples. Um, the reason we put one in each and then double up is because it lowers the overall energy of the atom rather than having two in one and none in the other. So that's, a, that's an excited state at that point. Yep, I think that's about all from there. Um, so these are the two methods. I'll teach you the periodic table method, but also in your extra resources under this week's topic, you'll see the CLS exam SUPS. That's what I'll attach to the exam paper um, and all the exams you do this semester. You do have this ladder that you can use. So basically you start from the bottom and you fill your way up. Um, but I, I won't specifically focus on that one. So if you've used it before, um, it's still there for you. So this is what an electronic configuration, a full electronic configuration looks like. So we've got the elements hydrogen all the way to neon. So the first two uh, periods, first two energy levels of your um, atomic, no, what am I thinking of? Periodic table. Oof, oof. Sorry, I've been on holidays. Periodic table, that's the word. Okay, so the first energy level is your, your uh, the 1s. There's no p's in that one. So you've got your 1s, you've got those two columns there. So you can hold up to two electrons. The way we write the number of electrons is a superscript at the top of that particular orbital that you've written in. So that we write the, the energy level, we write the orbital, and then as a superscript, we write how many electrons occupy that particular orbital. It's the number of electrons. <coughs> so we've got one that's occupying for hydrogen, for helium, we've now got two that are occupying that S orbital. When we get into lithium, we're now into the second period going across, so the second energy level. So we've got the 1s1, 1, 1s2, then we've got that 2s1, 2s2 coming in. So we've got our 2s1, and then we've got 2, and then we bring in that P. So we fill in one in each of the P's before we start doubling up. So we write it as 2p1, and then if we have another electron, we write 2p1 again, and then we go up to 3. So we've got 2p1, 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 if we've got three electrons in there. If we've got the fourth, we write 2p2, 2p1, 2p1, and then we bring the next and the next. So we end up with all 2p2s. So that's your full electronic configuration, so spelling out each of the orbitals. So how does that work? So here's a little table that we can look at. So your period, remember, is that number that goes out the front, so the 1, the 2, the 3, the 4. That's where you get it from. The orbital that you're using, it's a matter of remembering where they are. These are your S's. These are your P's and these in the middle here are your D's and we won't really go into F so don't worry about the F's, just leave them to the side for later. So S, P's and D's. So if I was to pick out 
let's say oxygen and I want to assign all eight electrons for oxygen so looking here you've got the the number the smallest number is eight that's the number of protons so if it was neutral that would be the same number of electrons so assuming it's neutral I'm going to assign all eight of those electrons so the way that I would do that is I'd start at the top of my periodic table and I'd work my way down to get to that element so my first element is my 1s and I've got my hydrogen and helium there so I'd start off with 1s just to scribble down here for you and then I'm going to completely use those two electrons to get to 8 so I put a superscript 2 there so I've assigned the first two electrons now I'm on to the next one so I'm on to the energy level 2 I'm still in that s block here and I've got to go through two elements to get to oxygen. So we've got 2s2. And then just to lump it all together, let's do the two Ps together. So I've done that one. That one just sits over there. So I've done that one, that one, that one. Now I'm at boron, so I'm up to electron five. So I've got one, two, three, four electrons. So I could do 2p4. So 1s2, 2s2, 2p4. If I count all my superscripts there, I've got 2 plus 2 plus 4 gives me 8. So that's how I've assigned the first 8 electrons. So that's a condensed way of writing it. I can write it out more, more detailed than that. So when I'm writing out my two Ps, I could expand that. I really don't have much room here. If they even fit that. I could add 2p1, 2p1, 2p1. That would account for one, two, three electrons. But I've actually got four, so I just need to put a two on one of those two p's. Conventionally, you'd probably put the first one with it, but it doesn't matter because they're degenerate. It doesn't matter which one you do it on. I'd go 2p, superscript 2, 2p1, 2p1. Okay, really quick, rough kind of intro there for you. Um, let's do some examples because the, the best way to grasp it is not me telling you how to do it. It's actually sitting down, thinking about how you actually do it and going through the process. So we've got carbon, sodium and manganese. So that, that last one there is for people that have done chemistry before. I don't expect people who haven't to be able to do that one yet, um, but we'll work up to it. Okay, I'll get you started on the first one. So, and then I'll let you have a go at the sodium. So, if we're looking at carbon, so going back to a periodic table, let me wipe out some scribbles. So, where's carbon? What element's carbon? <laughs> Six, yep. So we're trying to get to carbon. It's got six. So to get there, we've got to go past your one s. We've got two of them, two s, two, and then we're into that p block, and we've got two of them. So we've got one s, two, two s, two, two p. To get to those six. <laughs> so 
So if you've got a computer there, pull up a periodic table to have a go at these ones because I'll switch back to the other slide in a second. Miss my one person. That was awkward though. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so just to say we switching, um, so sodium and manganese are the other two you were going to have a go at. I'll give you a little bit more. Go through it. Yep. Yeah. Yep. 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 For now. Yep. So for now, we're just practicing writing something down. We'll refine the rules in a little bit. So I might go through sodium. Thanks, guys. So we'll go through sodium. So um, I don't know where I'm going to write. But anyway, so we're going to get up to 11. So starting here at the beginning, we've got 1S, and we would need both of those. So we go 1S2, and we've got 2, still in the S block. We've got two elements there. So we go 2S2. Scribbly. Then we go across with our P block. We'll count all those. So we've got 2P, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 2P, 6. And then we've got 3, we're in the S block, and we've just got 1 there. So if we count that up, we've got 2 plus 2 plus 6 gives us 10 plus 1 gives us our 11 electrons that we would be assigning. So it's just following the same pattern every single time. We go 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d, 10, and then in the fourth, so it would be 4P6. 
So if we go manganese, which I can totally fit onto this slide. I really need to put like big white squares on it, don't I? Um, mm. Okay, so just going to rub that out there. So if I'm going manganese, we've got 1s2, so 1s, one of two of those, so 1s2. And the second energy, I'm using all of it, so I've got s2, uh, P6, so second energy, S2, second energy, P, and I can have six in there. And I'm on my third energy, and I can have two in the S again, three S2, and then my P, I've got three, P6, and I've got four energy, S2. I'm just going to go down now because I've run out of room. Four S2, and then I'm in my D block. The D block's there to mess with you for now until we learn more. So the D block numbering is always going to be one less than the period that you're looking at. So we're in the fourth energy level or the fourth period. So it's going to be 3D. And we'll learn more about that when we get into quantum numbers and stuff. But it's 3D. And then if we count across, we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So 3D, 5. So there's a pattern. So it's 1S2, 2S2, 2P6, 3S2, 3P6, 4S2. Then we go 3D. We can get up to 10. And then we've got 4P up to 6. So don't worry, there'll be lots of practice on your tutorial sheet. Okay, so we'll just spend a little bit more time. We'll try and finish quarter two, but I just want to get through a few more slides. I know it's the, the end of the lecture, but this slide's super duper important. We don't do written exams anymore, but usually when orbital diagrams come onto the exam paper when it's written ones, I get one person or two people out of the cohort that draw nucleus in the middle and circles around it. Okay, we can't do that now because it's multiple choice, but I used to always be surprised how every year there would be at least one or two papers that had it. So orbital diagrams are these boxes, and these boxes represent orbitals. When the boxes are fused together, so they've got one line and two boxes coming off it, or three or five or seven, uh, we're showing that they've all got the same energy level and they're degenerate. So it's, this is the way I think of electronic configuration. My mind goes to orbital diagrams because it's the one that gives the most information. So if we want to look at nitrogen, the electronic configuration is 1s2, 2s2, 2p3. Now if I want to write out the orbital diagram for that, I would write it like this. So I've got a single box standing by itself and I'd assign that the 1s because the s orbital is just one orbital, so it's one box. And then I'd have the 2s next to it, one box, and then I would have the 2p, which is actually three orbitals that have got all the same energy fused together <coughs> as, the three, as the 2p. When I fill it, I'll do a, a live version of me drawing this out for you because it, it's easier to follow, I think. So I've got 1s, 2s, 2p. I don't write anything else besides that 1s, that 2s, or that 2p. No little superscripts or subscripts, just that. Then I do a one-headed arrow going up to represent one electron spinning one way, and a one-headed arrow going down, representing a single electron spinning in the opposite way. 
They're single-headed arrows. They're not double-headed arrows. Um, single-headed arrows represent one electron. Double-headed arrows represent two electrons. We're only looking at one electron, so it's single-headed. Um, so we fill the first one, we fill the second one. Then when we fill the 2p, we're following the rules. So one electron in each of the boxes, all with the same spin. So all upwards or all downwards, whatever you choose. I always go up first because it's just the way I do it, but it doesn't mean that's the only way, um, but all in the same direction to start with. So if we want to do fluorine, we've got now 5p. So this is when it's good because you can visualise it. So we've got three there now. If I want to put in two more into that p block, where would I be putting them? How would I put them there? First two, going down. Yep. So then I go opposite spin, down, down. So that would be the fluorine. Yeah, I like that better. That, that's good, isn't it? Yeah, you'll love it. It's great. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so other ways that we can re represent it is abbreviated and we can get into ones that have charges next. So if something has a positive charge, it's going to have a, an electron less than the number of protons. If it has a negative charge, you're going to have one more than what you look up on the periodic table. Now these abbreviated ones, so if I'm doing something that's in the D block, which we did before, we did um, manganese, that was a lot of 1s, 2s, 2s, 2s and it, it took a few... Now, abbreviated is for the very, very lazy. So you go to the closest noble gas before the element and you put that in square brackets and you write that down. So that's saying to the person that's reading it, everything's the same up until this element and then this is what's different. So for a lot of the D block elements, abbreviated is how you'd probably do it because it becomes a bit tiresome. So, for example, if I wanted to do manganese, I would go, okay, this is my noble gases, if you didn't know that. So it's the last uh, column on the edge. That's not an arrow. That's not an arrow still. Can't draw arrows. This one here. So these are our noble gases. So I would go manganese. That's on level four. So level three at the end would be argon. So everything's the same up until argon. So I'd do that. Square brackets, everything is the same until argon. And then what's different after that? I've got 4s2, 4s2, and then I've got, remember, 3d, and I get up to 5 there. So that's how we use that. So depending on the question, it might ask you one of the different ones. So you've got the full electronic configuration. So that's writing it out. 1s2, 2s2, 2p1, 2p1, 2p1. We've just got general electronic configuration where you, they just say, instead of the word full out giving, just electronic configuration. That's where you could do the same one as 2p3, so you don't have to spell out each single p orbital. Um, then we have abbreviated, so that's when you do the closest noble gas, all the same up until here, but this is different. Um, and then we have the orbital diagrams, which are the boxes in this the single headed arrows up and down. That's a lot to take in, so I'll leave that with you. Um, thank you so much for your attention.